Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Trinary Mary, to come and all of you. Uh, I imagine this sandwich is very good because I have many people in the room. <laughs> uh, so I'll talk a little bit about this topic. Uh, Jennifer already introduced me. I'm an economist. I like numbers. I like uh, econometrics, this sort of thing. But I've been faculty teaching for 40 years. So I think I'm entitled to say something <laughs> about what I do for so many years. Uh, so I'll give you an overview of how the Brazilian system of education works and how it's related to inequality. Uh, I'll explain a little bit some new about new initiatives to expand higher education and to include uh, underprivileged people in, in higher education. So, and now during that, I will brag about my university a little bit and show how, how wonderful we are and so and so. So, uh, so I will provide some background information. First of all, uh, we should realize that we're talking uh, of a, a big country. Uh, big in, in size, I mean, I lost it. Oh. No. It's, yeah. This is a map I found in the internet <laughs> comparing Brazil and the US. As a matter of fact, the, the land uh, surface of Brazil is larger than the, um, the lower 49 states, 48, I don't know. But it is. It's more north-south. If you put together, you have more U.S. and west and east, and then the north-south uh, direction, Brazil is larger. Why do I show this? Because, well, we are talking about a large country, and uh, lots of difference, geographic differences, weather differences. Part of the country is in the northern hemisphere, part in the tropical area, and we have like 10% of the land in the uh, subtropical area, which occasionally is most snow in the mountains. So lots of difference, difference in, in the occupation, the people that live there. In the south, we have more European-related uh, population in the north, more in local indigenous population. Now it's all mixed up. but uh, And Brazil is only 50% white. The other 50% is what you call non-white. And we have all, sh all colors in the population because uh, since the beginning, they start mixing up. And, and it's, it's a mess when you have to do, as I did, some of inequality studies uh, related to race, because you never know. Uh, we have a famous case of this huge, he was huge playing soccer, soccer, and now he's huge because he got so fat, Ronaldo. <laughs> and uh, he's obviously black. <coughs> and they were discussing one discrimination situation. He said, well, if I were black, I would be sorry or something. But uh, he has all the the biological things. Anyway, so this is sought to you to, to have an understanding. We have our almost 200 million uh, population, very high inequality, very, very high inequality, income inequality. Uh, this is the, a map of the country. This is Sao Paulo State, right on the uh, Capricorn line. And this is the equator line. And these are our neighbors, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, etc. Uh, you see that most of the income is concentrated here. But here, we still have 25% of population. This is the Amazon region. We have around 8% of population there. And here is the Midwest, our Brazilian savanna, where in the last 40 years, agriculture uh, expanded to. 
and uh, it's very productive nowadays and competitive, etc. And they received lots of population. Uh, this is some information. The first first one is population density. You can see that they are located in in the coast of the northeast region and typically here in the wealthiest part of the country. This is per capita GDP, and it's also concentrated here. Manufacturing and service production, and this is education. This is the uh, years of schooling. You can see, this is Sao Paulo State. You can see the difference. So it is, we are talking of different countries, really. It's, uh, when you talk about Brazil. And this is average number of years of completed schooling for people over 10 years old. So this is 2000, lots of red. Red is bad, green is good. And 2010, you can see that it get greener, more better here. The northeast part is improved and also we still have some bad situation here, but here we are talking about a big forest, very hard to get there. Uh, and the population, it's concentrated mostly in this part, so uh, uh, east. So we are observing noticeable improvements in education. Nowadays, almost all kids are kids are in school. Uh, we, we still have a lot to improve in terms of quality, but now we are putting, at least we're putting almost every kid in school. And more data will show. When you go to universities, then you can see that it's very low, only 13% of population even our neighbors in the south, Argentina, they have three times as much uh, share of population with university enrollment. But this is tricky because, as you might know, in Argentina, like in some European countries, anyone is entitled to enroll at the university. It can take you 55 years to get your degree, but you are still enrolled. They don't pay, and so they keep I asked, we were in La Plata with Werner last April. I asked the dean, how many students do you have? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> because you can count the, the enrollment, but you don't know which ones uh, have died or left the country or whatever, because anyhow. But they have more people enrolled anyway. So if compared with the other countries, we're really, really lagging behind. Does it pay to study in Brazil? That's a study done by uh, Fernando Holanda Filho. He's the son of Fernando Holanda Werner, you know the, the father, and this Samuel Pessoa, is step, uh, estimating return to education. So in blue is the what you gain just by studying going to, to universities, 32%. And this is postgraduate courses. And this is the accumulated. So you get 19% uh, more money if you have a college degree. <laughs> so it pays. Uh, and this is the big jump if you compare with senior high school, high school, and primary education. It pays a lot to study. We'll see that when we combine this information with the other information about access to education, you see that this is what builds up what I call the engine of inequality. And uh, it has to do with the way the system works. So up to the senior high school, before college, you can go to a public school and that it is well, if everybody go or goes, I don't know how to say that, uh, there will be no place. But typically, there is place for everyone in a public school. However, quality is very low. Uh, so you can also go to 
private high schools, and most people do. So the same at the university level, you can go to a private school paying tuition, or you can go to a public university, which is tuition free, no, nothing paid. So typically, up to senior high school, private schools are expensive, even more expensive than private colleges. They've had better quality, they have bad, best teacher, best facilities, everything. The public schools are tuition free, but very poor quality. And the distance is enormous. And I, I can show you, this is the 2011 national exam for students in the last year of senior high school. Uh, you see in language, Private high school got 260 and private 300. Math, the same. So there is a gap in quality in public versus private high schools. However, at the university level, you can see that's the other way around. The public Private are ex still expensive, but lower quality. They have young or uh, low quality teachers, faculty, poor labs, no library. Typically, they have uh, chalk and blackboard courses, law, business, uh, things that are cheap to, to supply, no, no big investment in capital costs. And of course, it's very, the, their placement records are very low. The public system is tuition free, better quality with full time PhD. They have research labs. They are um, research universities. Of course, placement is best. And uh, here are some information about the university system. Okay. Uh, no, it's four. No, which one? That one. Um, so now I will give some information about the university system. So in in Brown, you have the public system. It can be federal, national. The national government has is the main provider of. Uh, public universities, but some states, the state of Sao Paulo where I live, the state of Paraná, some four or five states also supplement, rich states of course, supplement that supply with uh, state universities like uh, U of I. And then you have private. In, in private you have the for-profit and non-profit universities. I'm talking here about universities, not colleges. We have plenty of colleges, of uh, like liberal art colleges, you know, evening courses, just. Uh. So most of the relevant private universities are either the Catholic or the Presbyterian uh, universities, typically. There are some exceptions in some areas, some in medicine, in business. They have very good uh, private business schools. And here is the number of graduates. You can see that the number of graduates is much larger, larger in, in private universities. I will provide more information on this soon. And here about quality. That's full-time faculty. So you have more at the public universities, very low in private universities. Typically, it's just a guy that knows how to do it and works and teaches in the evening or as a part-time uh, contract. And here in the uh, graph is the faculty with PhD. You can tell the difference. And you can see that whatever good is in the non is the private is in the nonprofit, which is our serious and uh, even research universities related to some religions congregation. And and here is the applicant's accepted rate. In the public, seven to one, and the private is one to one. I mean, 
in private, basically, if you want to study, you just go there and pay, and you go, typically. There is an entrance exam that is mandatory in each university. They have to do it by law, but they just ask your name, and if you answer it right, you're in, right? <laughs> if you don't, they get suspicious. But <laughs> um, So it's a, a huge divide between public and private universities. I'll go back a little bit. Uh, no. So how do rich people do? What sort of solution they have? Obviously, they go to senior high school in public, in private expensive schools. And after that, they get a ticket to study in the best universities. And then they get the best jobs. So what's left for the low-income people? Of course, they can only do the other way around. So if you are a poor family, you send your kid to the public school. And then when he's an adult or she, only private uh, universities available because competition is very tough to enter the best universities. I will show you some, some data for my university. This is the selection process. We have uh, a written exam, a very complicated thing. Imagine how to give an exam to 150,000 people. It's a war operation. You have logistics is on, and secrecy, of course, is an issue. Um, so every year, around 600,000 people finish high school, so they could try and attend. But already, three-fourths of, of those, they decide they cannot make it. So they already give up. So these brave guys take it, and we have two phases, and then we only take around 10,000. So it's a high, a very selective filtering process. So I used to say to, even when we are hiring new faculty as we are now, I tell them, well, the best asset we have is that we have the very good student body. And that for those who like to teach, this makes a, a whole difference, having excellent students. So. Giving the difference in quality and the difference in, in, in oh, these are the grades on a scale for 1 to 100 at my university in 2008. This is the grade obtained by the best student. And, and it covers all the high school uh, subjects, right? Math, chemistry, biology, etc. Geography, history, etc. So it varies from, from uh, field between fields, but typically the best students are almost at the same level, regardless of uh, of the school they are attending. Typically, the medical school gets the, the very brightest. But here is the the grade obtained by the last one who was successful. Then you have a it's more heterogeneous, and here is teaching teaching math, chemistry, and uh, geology, and uh, geography, and environment. So then you start having uh, bad students. Well, bad among the, the ones that took the exam. Already they are, they are self, there was a self-selection there. But enrollment is growing in the system. Are you? Making a question? No. no. Okay. Enrollment is growing fast. This is 2000 and recently even faster here. But still, as I mentioned, the first slide is is very low. Uh, and it's growing fast. And this is private. You know, these guys spot. 
an opportunity there, and there are government programs that are helping them. I, I'll talk about them. Uh, it's interesting that, the, you know, the Laureate Group, it's an international group, I think it's Canadian, or it, they are buying all colleges, private universities and colleges in Brazil and making it a money machine and, and lowering costs, firing faculty with PhD and hiring two without a PhD in their place for the same price. And, and also there is a, a concentration process of property concentration in schools. And uh, we will end up with four or five big groups of schools, with schools all over like McDonald's with branches all over the country. But we are talking low quality, you know, money making sort of thing. But there is some growth in the, pri the federal system and some growth in the state system. It is growing mostly in the private system, but also the public system is growing not as much as it is needed. And there is some online education, but very few. Nobody believes it. Nobody, I mean, people are ashamed of saying that they are taking an online course. So it's, it's very a cultural thing. I see that it here is also not a very well accepted thing. And typically, the most this favorite areas are business. And this is caused by one big program from my university for the state of Sao Paulo teachers. So it is not a open program. It's every, each and every one of the Sao Paulo state teachers, and I think they are 600,000, I don't know how many. They had to take this online upgrading uh, course. So at the graduate level, things are more uh, competitive, or more as it should be, more serious, let, let's say. And uh, there is an evaluation system produced by the Ministry of Education, but it's a peer review. So the evaluation is given by peers. They get, they select a committee let's say in education, they get 12 faculty, well-respected senior faculty from, from the best universities, and they get together. There is a part that's just objective, counting points of production, how many papers, how many books, how many students, how many. And then there is an assessment of quality at the end. And they give a grade one to seven, and one and two, you don't even talk about it. Three is the minimum standard. And five is uh, if you are only have a master program, and we have lots of masters in Brazil, it's still important. Then you get a maximum of five. And the five is what you get from the objective accounting of your points. Then six and seven are given on a more qualitative basis, and the seven is what the committee understands you are at the level of the international average on that field. Okay, this is the distribution. So we have here, this is grade four. We have two thirds of our programs that are four or less, and one third uh, six, uh, five to seven, and only three sevens, three percent, right? Three point three, and ten percent, six and seven, ten percent that are uh, competitive with international programs. That's what the committees say, and of course. The committee in law has one standard. The committee in education has another standard. The 
economics committee has a different standard, so you never know. You can not really compare uh, this. But so my university in this, it's a big university, 80,000 students. Um, you have some information there. We have 234 majors and um, 4,270 subjects. Uh, we provide 320 PhD programs and we have about 5,400 faculty. 97% uh, PhD and 82% full-time. We still have some part-time faculty in some professional areas. Law, for example, nobody wants to be a full professor in law. They make money. They have the, the seal of the university. They make money consulting and some the same in, in some professional fields like architecture or economics, business. And we have evening courses. By law, we are required to teach evening courses undergraduate level. Oops. And uh, of those grade seven programs, the University of Sao Paulo has 20% of, of them. Uh, and I just want to point out that the 2011, really, Shanghai Academy ranking uh, we rank at 144, best in, that includes Spain, Portugal, and Mexico, and, and of course, first in Brazil. Talking about uh, concentration, you saw the maps. The only five Brazilian universities that are in, the, in this ranking are either Sao Paulo or the Minas Gerais or Rio or Rio Grande do Sul. They are all in the rich part of the country which tells you about uh, concentration. And we, we account for 25% of all science produced in Brazil. So it is, okay, just I made my advertisement as I was required to by my boss. Uh, now I'll talk about the, some programs about increasing access to university. So we all know, and it is well recognized in the country that this engine of inequality is there and it's causing, it's probably behind the fact that Brazil has one of the highest inequality indexes in the world in terms of income. So there are some recent programs. That's a student credit, a student loans program. It's, it's, it's there. We have, uh, a program of scholarships for students to go to private universities. We have a quotas program, social inclusion, is, uh, I will talk about. We have a program for uh, students with special needs. And there is a huge expansion program of the un federal university system. They have established many new universities in the country in different places. It has been an explosion of new universities, and uh, people are discuss, dis, discussing, arguing about quality, but this is something. So this is the number of federal universities. You can see that from 2002 or three on, it's going uh, very fast. By the way, federal universities are among the best, as I showed before. It's the public is in the good side, right? There is a discussion about the, the quality of these new ones because they are hiring whatever they can. And of course, you cannot generate new candidates in a very short period of time. So you have to select from whatever is available. There is very good, there are very good candidates, but you were hiring like 5,000 new faculty and uh, you only have 1,000 quality faculty, you are expanding with whatever you can get. I have a student doing PhD with me, she has a master's degree, she got hired by uh, Virginia, Federal University of Virginia, with a master's degree on it. So it's not good, but it's better than not having it. By the way, she's, she'll finish PhD soon. So. 
When was I hired? 1972. I had, I didn't have any, even master degree. I was in the f end of my first year and it was expanding too. And uh, so time will probably heal any problems we have by this fast growth. And this is federal government expenditure of with universities, it's also going fast and it's a new thing. It's they're pouring money in, in, in the, the area. They are sending more than that. Another thing that, that I didn't mention, they have this um, a program called Science Without Borders. They are selling, sending 100,000 uh, students, undergraduate students in, in STEM areas to study abroad. We have plenty of here in engineering in Illinois with full scholarship for a year or two years. A federal government is really pouring money on, on this. So this is student loans. Um, it's been there forever. Now they have improved a little bit. Uh, you can get loans as you do here. It's not a, you, you have to pay back later. Uh, I'm not, it's not interesting, just show the numbers. This is, this is observed until 2008, and this is this forecast. I'm not sure this happened because the other programs I'm gonna talk about compete with this. So there is at least 600,000 students in student loans. It's highly subsidized as here, and, but you have to pay back. There is a problem of not paying back and uh, so students get in trouble later on because they cannot buy a house because they haven't paid their student loan. The same story here, I hear. This is, uh, this is a very innovative and bold project presented by the Labor Party government that is more uh, anti-capitalistic, anti, I mean, more left-winger. And they came with this idea. They give a voucher for you if you're a poor guy. You can go to any private college and they'll pay college for you. So there, is a, there was a big discussion because what you were doing, well, the, those, this is, those, those are the opponents talking. What you're doing is you're giving money to the bad guys, the guys that run for profit, uh, bad quality colleges. But government argued back that you are giving opportunity to people that wanted to study but didn't have the money to, to go. It was a very controversial uh, process, but it's, it's there, it's working. Uh, there are rules, but this is a way government sought to, to, to boost the supply of uh, opportunities to poor people. They are expanding their, their own supply in federal universities, but they are using the idle capacity in the private uh, university system with different uh, quality. Even, even the state universities like mine expanded. We expanded 10% uh, the number of uh, places. And this is the number of scholarships. We're talking 250,000 in 2009. It's probably around 400,000 nowadays. It's growing. And um, there is a very, another controversial one, uh, as it is here, is about, uh, what do you call? It's not equal opportunity, huh? affirmative, action. affirmative action sort of program. So this October, it, the new law was sanctioned by the president. 
So now it's the law. 50% of new students in federal universities, they cannot rule for state universities, will come from students who took high school in private, uh, in public uh, institutions, the, the bad ones, as I mentioned before. So if you had to take high school in a not so good institution, you get some chance to get university on a competitive basis. 25% of those will come from poor people. So you had to be poor and go to a public high school. And 25% to blacks or pardos, what's it called, a mixed, and indigenous. And this allocation varies across states depending on the proportion of the population. They have data, census data, and they, they have it. They are starting next year with 12% in 2016 to be 50%. That's, and there is a big discussion on this as it is here. My university did something different. We have that, uh, as I described before, we have this very competitive <coughs> entrance exam. So what we decided to do some 10 years ago is to give a 3% bonus in a num number of points for students with the same coming from, from public high schools. And I remember the first numbers, we get around 10,000 new students every year. The first two years, we got 800 students under that program. That means we replaced 800 of the, the ones that would have pass it without it. There's a big discussion and I'll come to it later on. And there is a research done on quota students and they, they had 36,000 students uh, researched to get who gets the benefit. So at that time, that was before this law, there was a different uh, ruling. Uh, each university decided to do it on their own. Now they, they are forced by law to do it, the federal ones. So 70 was public schools, 25 ethnic groups, and then low income, and, and so. Um, so this student loans, I, I already mentioned. And there, there are some, some studies on performance. In my university, those 3% of points got 800 students that would never, would never be there without the, the bonus. So we follow their performance. It turns out that they are better. They are on the average performance. Some are very in the top. I mean, they, they replicate the student body. They cannot pass the exam because they have lower preparation. But once they are given the same classes, the same books, the same libraries, etc., they perform as well as. Now come back to this. So this was uh, an experiment done with uh, the first year and last year students in the same course, the same school, uh, and it's a, it's a comparison of grades in the first year. This is scholarships. Those, I mean, let me say it right. This is in private schools, those who got this voucher to study. So those are the ones with scholarships. Those are the ones without scholarships, and this is the difference. Whenever positive, the ones with scholarships did better. So in the first year, the ones who got scholarships 
performed better, probably because they are more eager to study, they were, I mean, you guys have to explain that, I, I can't, you are the, the experts here. But when you go to the last year, this is the difference. And the differences are minor, and it can go either way, and basically, you cannot tell there is a big difference. Once they mix up with the other guys, they sort of perform as well as off. But anyhow, they don't perform, <coughs> they don't have a poor performance, poorer performance. You cannot say that. They are about, they're in the pack. So you, we are not losing much in terms of quality by using this. That's, that's the idea. Because in my university, for example, there was a huge discussion in, because we are up-nosed, because, because we are the best in the country, and so and so, you know. Um, so we didn't want to do it. So our role is to train the elite and, you know, the sort of, talking that uh, you can get in faculty meetings. And um, so finally, it, it passed. We, we voted in the University Senate. It passed. But the, and everyone would say, OK, we know we are doing something as a social program. We are not, this is not education. We are losing in the education side by accepting these people. Now everyone is convinced otherwise, because we have research on that. And, uh, and, and why is, how can we explain this and this, that, and now we'll end here. Imagine this is the distribution of personal skills, and this is for the rich people and this is for poor people. And I guess you cannot say there is a, the distributions are different because one is rich, the other is poor. This is co cognitive, this is, you know, I'm not uh, an expert, but this is my supposition. So you have very few people with very high personal skills and the majority of people have lower skills, the same here. So they are comparable. But the poor guys, they start from below because they didn't go to good university, they didn't have good food, they didn't have good books, etc., etc., etc. So there is a gap that's not related to personal attributes, it's related to social attributes. So you are giving, you are putting these guys, replacing these guys. You are putting poor people in this pack and taking, these guys are replacing this, and that we are taking just the same amount of of people. So is there a gain or a loss? Well, provided that you are taking the very best in this pack and putting there, you are replacing students with lower performance. So you're not losing in terms of academic uh, performance up to a point, which uh, which one? I don't know. It's a matter of uh, empirical matter. But typically, this is what we observe in our university with our minor change. We are talking about 5 7% of the student body that we are substituting. So it might not be a, a better thing. And then is there is the discussion. This is the last thing. It's very hard to change this. The students, in, especially parents in Brazil, believe that if you pass the entrance exam, you got a right. And your rights should be respected. And you have a right to get free education, good education, because you're good. And government should provide you that. So it's a citizen right. Uh, well, maybe we should reuse a lottery and not, uh, so it's just a right. It's, if it is democratic, it should be random. 
right. But if you use it as a mechanism to reduce inequality, then this is part of what is being done in Brazil right now. You are using education to reduce poverty. Then you need some sort of uh, a different ways of selecting it. And then who should pay for it varies in different situations. But if in, in my state, and this is a good thing of working for my university because I read here and see on TV that UFI goes to Peoria to discuss budget every year with the legislators. We don't have to. It's in the state's constitution that we have a cut, fixed cut of total revenue of the state. They cannot touch it. So we only pray that the economy goes well so that we get more money and then we do whatever uh, we want with the money under the law. But why is that the, the, my state society puts this money aside to, to educate these people? Of course, it's not as a sits and right point of view. It's an investment in the future of the state. So we, they are putting money to get a return when these students are graduate, they, they get, well, they, they have innovations, they are good businessmen, they are improve the efficiency and productivity of the country. So there is a payback. That's why we are investing this money. If that's the case, it should be selective, but based on the potential future contribution to that goal. And that for sure is not obtained by grades in the entrance exam. The grades only show what, what, which are the, the best students to take tests. I once was a dean. I, had, uh, I used to have lunch with the 40 best students in the entrance exam in my college, 10 in each uh, department. And I can tell you, half of them will not succeed in life because they are just, you know, <laughs> they, can, they, can, they get good grades. They cannot talk. They cannot interact. They don't have the other skills needed to, to excel and, and provide whatever society need, needs back from them. So this is a different world. So entrance exam doesn't do the job. We need to think about other things. Who are the ones who will benefit the most? And then we are not talking about a right. So it's like a, 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 a drafting system that you, you had for, for, for army. You pick the ones with the largest potential contribution to the development of the country. So it's, it's a duty is not a, a right. So this is the, I'll, I'll finish here. This is the situation we have in Brazil. We have this high inequality. We have the educational system pumping up more inequality every year. There are changes now. Changes are very disputable. But the funny thing is that the, the, the stakeholders, the, one, the, the, the ones that oppose the most for introducing tuition so that rich people could pay for public education and then subsidize poor people, those are the left-wingers. The ones that should think about it and imagine that their constituency would be better off in that way. But this is an, a no starter. If they start talking about imposing tuition, there will be a full strike and uh, uh, invasions and so and so. So the left wing is very keen of letting things democratic. In doing that, they are entitling the upper middle income class to get their places and reproduce inequality. 
there are changes. Changes are in the right direction. Too small, given the size of the problem. But I think we are more optimistic these days than we were like 20 years ago. Thank you. I'm sorry I spoke too long, too much. I'd like to at least, uh, I mean, you saw in one you read a tremendous expansion of the private sector, the private university, which I think is a monstrosity that I've seen. It's, it's a business, and often it's the people who didn't succeed in get, getting to the federal university who have jobs, and once they have jobs, in order to better themselves, they need a certificate, so they enroll and pay. And the, most of them are night schools. Uh, the, the students are tired when they go, they work all day, the professors are tired, they work in other places, and, uh, and basically the owners of the uh, private universities, they want to do research they'll care about, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that seems to me a strange uh, phenomenon. And what is your reaction to that? Well, part of the, the explosion you saw in enrollment right. is related to the program that's government paying it for it. That's government giving, giving voucher for poor students to, to access that place. And part is increasing in supply. There, those private groups, that are expanding like crazy. Especially in big cities where uh, location is important. If, if you are more than 30 minutes away from school, you cannot make it in the end of the day. So they are sort of like, CVS in Walgreens, one in each corner. Uh, they are getting, you know, more students doing that. But it is a problem because, well, first of all, I think it's better if they do it than if they stay at home watching novella. <laughs> it is, I think it, they are better off. Uh, However, we have to work on that with time and uh, see if we can have improvements in that system. Uh, as you well know, in the past, there was an assessment of the private uh, schools. The students had to take a test at the end. It was mandatory because Private schools don't pay tax. That's part of it. Since it's education, they don't pay tax. But they are making money. So government established that, OK, if you want to keep that status, tax status, you have to send your students to, to the exam. So they said, OK, let's do it. And then government started compiling the data and publicizing the rank. And then they got upset. That was unconstitutional. They got good lawyers. And so you remember Camarguinho? The, he was the person we know. He was the executive uh, CEO of the, this institution of uh, the association of schools. And they lobbied to now it's not in place anymore. So we should do something to tell students about whatever they are getting. And, and in the short run, the long run, we should work to improve the quality uh, of students all over, starting with uh, the basic education. When we do that in a three decade, four decade uh, period of time, maybe those guys will not make money anymore because other students will go else elsewhere. But nowadays, there is supply, there is demand, they're making money, and students are sort of happy. And government's paying for part of it. But again, in the short run, I think it's better than the alternative. And we are talking about big numbers. Again, if we come back to my first map, it's a big country, 
200 million people. Uh, when they started the, the first national exam, which was also disputed, uh, they had to send the paper test to each and every school in the country with secrecy. And of course, it's a nightmare in, in the Amazon. Sometimes you have to, to ride three days in a, in a boat to get to the school right in the middle of the... And there were problems, of course, because, you know, temptation is there, right? But nowadays, it seems they are doing this exam is there. I think now it's there to forever. They are ranking the, you can get to the internet and get the, the rates of any school in the country the, at the senior high school. Soon, we'll have that for colleges. And that is the beginning. But it's a long way. We have a similar problem here with the uh, proprietary vocational school sector. Many of them are private, and then the same idea, access to student loans. But, but the question was about uh, accreditation of private universities and quality control and reaccreditation. Can you talk a little bit to the accreditation uh, system? Yeah, there is. It's at the state level. There is a state council of education, and even even the University of São Paulo, uh, each department every three years have, has to show the some records. Uh, there are some forms, etc. And they visit the most problematic ones, and sometimes they they take it off. But the ones more. The strongest one doing that, for instance, if you go to law school, think about quality. Law school you can find everywhere. Uh, then there is a bar, there is a bar exam, and typically only 10% of all graduates pass the bar exam. That tells you something about uh, the quality. Uh, in medicine, the the medicine, the, the, the doctors themselves, they're shutting down some schools because they don't pass the minimum standard. But typically, it's very, I don't recall any school being shut by being low quality. They get, no, they make sure they, they have the minimum to, be, to get a renovation of the accreditation every three years. And they survive. So pass rates are not published. Pass rates of um, certification. Not, not at the school level, and they are very yeah. careful. For instance, they could, they just uh, publicized the last last year's exam results. They are doing it again now. Uh, they could have ranked the schools. They have all the data. But they made sure lawyers won't get money out of this. So you can check your record as a student. You can check the record of your school, but that's it. Or your region, your state, your city. So you can, you are able to know what's your position and the position of your school, but it's not. There is no ranking. When there were the worlds are ranking, then the schools started investing more, hiring people with PhDs, uh, hiring pay more, and uh, even hire people to give their name as PhD, even if they didn't teach. There were some bad cases like this. But once it stopped being publicized. They just fired the PhDs. And uh, we had lots of colleagues in my university who took an early retirement to get money in private universities. And now they are unemployed because, I mean, they are retired. They're getting money. But uh, 
but it is it is a complex system. 